So these verses that we're looking at under the heading Baptism of the Holy Spirit basically just point out the sections in the book of Acts where the baptism of the Holy Spirit was experienced and received. And so we've got, of course, Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, and then we've got uh, Samaria in Acts chapter 8, which means, you know, they're starting their process going from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. That's Philip ending up in Samaria. And um, he solicits the help of John and Peter to come and pray for the people to lay hands on them that they might be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then we have uh, Paul, Saul Paul's experience in Acts 9. And then we've got the surprising experience of Peter when he was preaching to the Gentile crowd at the house of Cornelius. And as he was preaching the word of God, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as they were listening to the message. And uh, they were astonished because they were hearing them speak with tongues and magnifying God. And everybody was amazed because the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Gentiles. Are you kidding? These aren't even Jews and they're not even Samaritans. They're Gentiles. And they can receive the Holy Spirit. And so they were baptized in water after having been baptized with the Spirit. So obviously, through hearing the message, they were converted. They believed it as Peter was preaching. And then the Holy Spirit came upon them. And then, in confirmation of that, they submitted to public baptism. An interesting case is in Acts chapter 19, where uh, Paul came to Ephesus. And he found some disciples there. This is the first time he visits Ephesus. Ephesus. And he says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? We've never ever even heard if there is a Holy Spirit. Well, into what then were you baptized? Well, into John's baptism. And then he explained uh, to them uh, that John's ministry was a baptism of repentance, saying that they should believe in Jesus Christ. When they heard that, then they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So apparently, the way I read it, these people weren't yet converted into Christ. They were simply disciples of John, and so they didn't know anything about the work of the Holy Spirit yet. And so when John explained, or Paul explained the gospel to them, they received Christ, and then it says he laid hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And one of the things you'll notice as you go through the incidents of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, not every one of them is associated with somebody speaking in tongues. So the position of the Assemblies of God denomination, for example, which say that the uh, speaking in tongues is the primary and important evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't spoken in tongues, you're not baptized with the Holy, baptized with the Holy Spirit. That is not substantiated by the book of Acts. So someone may, but they don't have to. Uh, sometimes people are baptized with the Holy Spirit where they just have an insatiable hunger for the scriptures. And they've never had that before and they just can't get enough and, and they're just coming alive and they have a new appreciation for everything that's some people's experience other people they have a freedom of speech a boldness that's what boldness is really just confidence freedom of speech to talk about jesus if, anywhere that that they find themselves and uh, that was my experience i just was you know i was witnessing to doorknobs and to dogs and to people and anybody that <laughs> That had a, anything that had a pulse, you know, was hearing the gospel. Uh, but you know, it was just a wonderful freedom of speech, and and so there are different experiences that are evidence. But the thing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that when one receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is most definitely true that they know they've experienced it. Whatever this experience might be, be it's an identifiable, clear experience. So I want to give you some summary statements about this heading, this distinctive of Acts 2. Uh, if you've not been baptized with the Holy Spirit, study these passages and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit yourself. Okay, so that's like primary. And there's going to be an opportunity for that tomorrow night, maybe even today if somebody wanted it. Uh, you could talk to, to us and we'd be happy to pray with you over that. And in your ministries, number two, make it a major point of emphasis to ensure that people are filled with or baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is like, I'm not going to say it's Christianity 101 because that tends to, you know, de-escalate its importance. But it's primary to the living of the Christian life and to serving Jesus to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And some people are not. 
you know, they're Christians, they're saved, the Spirit no doubt lives inside of them, because you can't be a Christian unless the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. But there's a difference between the Holy Spirit being in a person and a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being upon a person. The Holy Spirit coming upon us is for power to be his witness. And that's what Jesus told the disciples they needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit for. So make it a major point of emphasis to ensure that people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Ask that question. The people come in. Have you heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Maybe they're from another church background or whatever. And they may need to be comfortable in the church for a while. Get used to the teaching of the word. Get used to, you know, this being a safe place, which of course it is. Be be used to the idea that they are indeed a kingdom of priests and they can hear from Jesus themselves. All those kinds of things. They may, to, may need to get comfortable. But there's a point in time where it's really good to ask that question. So have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Would you like to know more about it if you haven't? And then you can lead them into a greater understanding and then uh, pray for them. And then the third point is learn how to pray over people and lay hands on people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing in the Bible that says that the pastor has to be the one that does this or any of the identified leaders in the church. You can pray for somebody to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit just as much as I can. Now, somebody would say, well, what about Philip in Samaria? He called for Peter and John, the apostles. Apparently, he needed the big boys to come down and, uh, and, and pray for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, there was a reason for that. And the reason for that is the gospel had gone to the Gentiles, or the, the Samaritans, who were sort of like half Gentile, half Jew. The gospel had gone to the Gentiles. This was uncharted territory. They hadn't had a case of wholesale Samaritan non-Jewish conversions. So could they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? So Philip had an idea. You know, it would be really good if Peter and John would come down. This would give apostolic legitimacy to the work that God is doing here in Samaria. And so when they came down and they prayed for them, that gave legitimacy to that work. And so the Jewish believers in Jerusalem would realize it's okay for Samaritans to be baptized with the Holy Spirit too, like we had been. They're full-on believers just like we are. They're part of the church just like we are. This was a big stretch for the Jewish believers, by the way. This wasn't just simple stuff. Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. They didn't connect with each other. They were hostile to each other. And so this was a major thing, this, this chasm to be bridged uh, by the Spirit. So that's just the reason why Peter and John came down. That's not an argument to say that it takes an apostle or a pastor to pray for someone to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Anybody can. Same would be true of water baptism, by the way. It doesn't need a pastor or an elder to, to water baptize somebody. Um, if that's what somebody wants, that's fine too, but it doesn't require it. Uh, so Luke, Luke 11 is a great passage for this, you know, where Jesus talks about you know, the relationship with the Father and asking uh, what earthly father asks, that the son asks for bread, would the father give him a stone? And it's ridiculous, of course, he wouldn't. And then Jesus said, if you then, being evil, now know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more should your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So God the Father very much wants to give the gift of the Holy Spirit to as many as will ask. So this isn't something he's begrudgingly going to dole out to someone. He wants to do this. He's predisposed to do this. But we have not sometimes because we ask not, according to James chapter 4. So let's ask, and let's get the people to ask. That's important, and then the Lord will do his thing. And then this fourth point is something that I think is very important. And, and sometimes I've seen this with people that are praying for someone to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're trying to wait for some kind of evidence, and sometimes it's the evidence of the gift of tongues. And I've seen some of my... Uh, more Pentecostal and charismatic brothers actually trying to coach people into speaking in tongues. So let's say, okay, so just start moving your tongue. <laughs> you know, start flapping your gum, blah, 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 you know. And then, you know, okay, you got it! You know, and, and that kind of thing. Well, of course that's silly. You can't find that in the book of Acts. So don't go there, obviously. <laughs> and don't do that. So, but the point is, we don't have to give people assurance or even wait for assurance for the people to have it. 
uh, if they've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's something only the Holy Spirit can do. And the same thing is true of giving people assurance of their salvation. I've led people to Christ. I've led enough people to Christ over the years. But I've learned over the years, I do not try to give anyone assurance of their salvation. Why? Because it's not my job. That's the job of the Holy Spirit and the job of the scriptures, testifying to their human spirits that they're indeed saved. Not my job to talk them into it, you know, and, and uh, that kind of thing. I want them to study the scripture. I want them to have a relationship with the Spirit and get their assurance directly from the Holy Spirit. I'll tell them what the scripture teaches about salvation and how one receives eternal life and, and, and you know, what it means to receive salvation by grace through faith and those kinds of things. But it's up to them to get their own assurance because it's theirs then. Does that make sense? Well, the same is true with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Don't try to bring people into assurance. Let them discover that themselves. Yes, I do know that I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit because this is what happened to me. And this is when I began to discover the wonderful experience of the Spirit-filled life. That's what happened. And people need to discover that on their own. Right? Okay, so that means you can be relaxed when you're praying for somebody because you don't have to wait for some, you know, you know, fireworks to happen. They may happen. And if they do, don't be freaked out by it. But they may be, it may be a real calm response and may be no visible or outward evidence at all at that moment. But they'll go home, and if they really did pray sincerely, the Father will give them the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they will change. There will be something different. And they'll come back the next week, and they'll go, you won't believe what's happened to me this last week. Yes, I would, but I want to hear it, so tell me. See, that's the exciting thing. Because then you've witnessed the Holy Spirit doing it. And that's who we want to depend upon. Amen? Amen. Okay, the next distinctive is the distinctive of evangelism. And obviously, Acts chapter 2 records a very, the beginnings of a very evangelistic church. So remember the story, you know, uh, the crowd that was gathered around the speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost, they said, these, some of them said, these men are full of new wine. They're drunk. And that was Peter's, that was his open door. He had to answer that charge. And so Peter gets up, in verse 14, he says, Men in Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> we don't do that around here. We wait until 5 o'clock. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. Over the time. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes this section from Joel. And I'm going to read this whole sermon. Do you mind? And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he quotes the whole passage in Joel. Uh, Part of it refers to the day of Pentecost. Part of it refers to the day of the Lord, which is still future. Verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? This is the same Peter when the servant girl said, you are one of them. Your language betrays you. Your speech betrays you. I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of this man. The same Peter is standing up and saying, this is what happened, fellas. This is what happened, ladies and gentlemen. 
you took the Messiah of Israel. Illegally you took him, and you had him crucified on a Roman cross, and he was dead, but God raised him from the dead. You did this, and you know you did this. So the same Peter who denied the Lord is now boldly advocating for the Lord and directly pointing out the sins of the people to them. You know, what's that called? It's either called insanity or boldness. And I think it's called boldness. He was bold. And that's the kind of power that he needed and the rest of the disciples needed to be in this moment. And Peter rose to the occasion by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 28, for David said, verse 25, for David says concerning him, concerning Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You've made known to be the, path, the ways of life. You'll make me full of joy in your presence. So this is a Psalm of David, Psalm 16, but it's obviously a Psalm of the Messiah. This is speaking about what the Messiah is saying himself to his father. You're not gonna leave my soul in the grave. You're not gonna allow your holy one, your anointed one, me. You're not gonna allow me to see corruption. My body is not gonna be in the grave long enough to experience corruption. You've made known to me the ways of life and you're, you make me full of joy in your presence. And Jesus, of course, was very much looking forward to resurrection. He was looking forward to 40 days later, ascension. And he was looking forward to being reunited with his father in heaven. Now as the God-man, not just as God the Son, but now God the Son and man the Son. So Jesus added a nature while he was here with us, and he still has that nature. Did you know that? He's still a human being, as is he God. A lot of people don't know that, that Jesus still retains his human nature. And you know, in the, in the history of the church, there has been more struggle or difficulty with the, the doctrine of the humanity of Christ than there has been with the doctrine of the divinity of Christ. Did you know that? But he's human. He's very human. He's like you and I are, except he never sinned. And he understands what it means to be a human being, and he understands what it means to depend upon the Father, and he lived his life that way here on earth, and now as the God-man, he's seated at the right hand of his Father in heaven, making intercession for you and me. And we have someone now that we can completely relate to because he's one of us. He's not God the Son only. He's God the Son, and he's man the Son as well. This is a major argument of the book of Hebrews. And the reason he can be our great high priest, compassionate, and empathetic toward us, someone with whom we can relate. And we share so much with him that we don't even know we share with him. When we suffer because of something related to our Christian life, we're suffering with the sufferings of Christ because in whatever thing we suffer in, he's been there, he's done that, he's suffered that way too. And one of the things that I've learned to do over the years is that it's, I feel like I'm suffering, whether emotionally, mentally, whatever it might be, uh, in the course of living the Christian life. I'll think of Jesus, and I'll think of him in the Gospels. And where, where in the Gospels does it show that he may have suffered similarly? And there's always a story, there's always a, a statement, there's always a, a section in, in the Gospels that show where he suffered similarly. So then I'll talk to Jesus about that. Say, now, Lord, you and I have something in common now that we didn't have before. I'm sharing in something that you experienced. And you're sharing with me in something that you experienced. And now we have fellowship with one, one another in this, and it's so helpful to me. I'm so glad that you're involved with me in this, because this is hard, but you know that it's hard. And Paul said, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I'll learn that.
but it's only because Jesus is a man as well as being God. He added a need a nature at his incarnation through the virgin birth and he didn't shed that nature when he went to heaven. To me it would have been like one of the space launches, you know, I would have shed that capsule and just gone to heaven as God and left the humanity bar behind, you know. But not Jesus. He retained his human nature. How do I know that? Well, there is one God and there is, present tense, one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. He's still a man. Does that make you love him more than you just loved him five minutes ago? Isn't that awesome? I love that doctrine of the humanity of Christ. And it helps me read the New Testament differently. By the way, I watched the first season of the movie The Chosen, that series. I highly recommend it. Because I think they do a better job with the humanity of Jesus than any, any movie presentation of Jesus that I've ever experienced. So just, you know, check it out yourself. But uh, it drew me nearer to the Lord. Not to the guy on the screen or the actor, but it drew me nearer to Jesus. You know, I, I felt like I understood him better. Anyway, just a little commercial that means I'm, I'm not getting any kickback from that. So we're still reading this story. So Peter quotes uh, David a messianic psalm, Psalm 16, verse 29. Men of brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. He's both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the, of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted by the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. So the explanation of what you've been seeing and hearing today is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel and a fulfillment of the prophecy of David in Psalm 16 with regard to the Messiah. And you know that David's tomb is here with us today. In fact, they could have taken a short walk from where Peter was preaching the sermon, and they could have seen the tomb of David, where his body had laid. Very close to the upper room in Jerusalem. Very close to the steps outside of the, uh, of the gates of the, of the city. It's all right there in proximity to one another. And they knew it. And so he's very effective in quoting this. And notice how Peter is just quoting these large segments of Scripture. I wonder if he'd ever quoted these before. I wonder if he ever even knew that he knew them. I wonder if this wasn't just the Holy Spirit taking what had been put in him through those synagogue services that he attended growing up. I remember when my son uh, got baptized with the Holy Spirit in Bible college. He went to Bible college to escape his own carnality. Because he knew that if he messed up in Bible college, he'd get kicked out, and that was the level of accountability he needed. He had no intention of, of doing much with his life at that point, as far as spiritually was concerned. But he got baptized with the Holy Spirit, and surprise, surprise, the Lord called him into ministry. But then when he started getting into ministry, he started teaching the Bible at Bible college. And he said, all those things that I'd learned growing up, they were dormant under the surface of the soil, but the Holy Spirit brought them back by, the, by his power. And I knew them, but I didn't know them in that way. Now I know them. And he's just, uh, he's a Bible teaching machine. He's, he's a pastor now and he's, does a good job. Anyway, I wonder what happened with David here in all of this, I mean with Peter. It's an interesting thing. He quotes these sections of scripture Verse 34, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And if you are a Jew in that crowd listening to this sermon and you happen to have been there when Pilate 
delivered Jesus over to be crucified, and maybe you were even in the crowd when the religious leaders were stirring up that crowd, uh, demanding that Barabbas be freed and Jesus be crucified. And you're sitting there listening to the sermon. You know that this same Messiah that you put to death on the cross is alive today, that the lion of the tribe of Judah is on the loose. <laughs> Whoa. You are in deep trouble. Deep trouble. And you know it. What's this lion going to do? Is he going to come after me? Because I put him on, on the cross. But remember, Jesus, when he was on the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for their sin of delivering him to be crucified, but they didn't know that yet. <laughs> the ways of God, the ways of God, they blow our minds, don't they? So in verse 37, it says, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? They were busted, and they knew it, convicted. They were absolutely wrong in what they had done, and they knew that they were wrong. The sermon had convinced them, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent, that every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And like my friend Johnny Johnson, who's a Texan now in heaven, said, They got saved real good. <laughs> they got saved real good that day. <laughs> they did. And the message wasn't watered down. That word, which is too scary to utter in many of our churches today, repent. It was actually used in a sermon. Because, see, there was no watering it down. Peter knew that John's first words were repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and that Jesus' first sermons were repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if it's good enough for John, it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for, enough for me. This is what you need to do, repent, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Now, the baptism itself wasn't going to cleanse them for their sins. Their faith in Christ would forgive them, but baptism was the outward sign that it was real. So the rest of the passages here in this section on evangelism are talking about the way evangelism exploded from the lives of these early disciples. And there's a lot of great uh, stories here. But one thing that's an interesting study to do is to look at every place in the book of Acts where there is a recounting or a telling of the sermon that was preached. You can read the sermon. And you can look for the key elements of the gospel presentation in the sermon and see if they're there. It's a very interesting story, very interesting study. The key aspects of the gospel presentation are given to us by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. This is the gospel that I delivered to you and by which you are saved, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose from the dead according to the scriptures on the third day. So a good gospel presentation should include the death of Christ for our sins. It should include the burial, which was the certainty that he actually died. And it should include his bodily, physical resurrection from the dead. It should include those things. So take those elements and study the sermons. And you'll find, I'll just give you a preview, you'll find that the sermons contain those elements in it, with the exception of one. When Paul was on Mars Hill in Athens, preaching to the Athenian philosophers, it was an amazing message. I mean, it was an incredible sermon, wasn't it? And, and he reasoned with them, and he convinced some of them that there actually was a resurrection from the dead and that the second coming was gonna happen. Some of them believed those things but he never talked about the death of Jesus Christ for our sins according to the scriptures. So there were mixed results uh, as a result of that sermon. This, the text says that some believed, 
Others weren't persuaded and others said, we'll hear you again about this matter another day. That was the basic response of the people. But it was sort of an underwhelming response compared to a lot of the Gentile crowds that Paul preached to. But it's interesting because from Athens, Paul left that city and made his way to another city, Corinth. And he got to Corinth, and he was there for 18 months preaching, and the Lord encouraged him to stay there. Nobody's going to hurt you while you're here. But when he wrote to the Corinthians later, he told them what was going on in his mind and heart when he was on his way to Corinth, and when he knew he was going to land in Corinth and do ministry there. He said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. <laughs> so Paul decided maybe that was not a good move to not include the crucifixion in the sermon in Acts 17 to Athens. But I'm not going to make that mistake in Corinth. I'm going to actually preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he did. And there were notable and marked results. Uh, when, when I was in New England once, we had, uh, we had dinner with a woman who at that time was the chaplain of Harvard University. She was the Christian chaplain for Harvard University. And she told us a story about uh, Billy Graham coming to Harvard. He was invited by the, by the Christian students that were on campus which isn't an oxymoron, there are Christian students on Harvard. Uh, but anyway, by, by, uh, he was invited by them to come and, and preach to the, to the student body. And so he came. And apparently, as she told the story, he prepared one of his best apologetics-related messages. You know, it was mixed with good sound reasoning for the inspiration of the scriptures and for evidence for the resurrection and, and some anecdotes from philosophy and these kinds of things and he put it together it wasn't his typical crusade message and he delivered the message and it was apparently with mixed results kind of an ambivalent response so he was invited years later she told us uh, to come again but this time he sent out notice and he asked some of the leaders on campus he said he said uh, this is what happened last time. I'm thinking of changing it up this time and having a different approach. And they encouraged Billy Graham, just do what you do at the Crusades. Talk about Jesus, talk about sin, talk about our need for Christ, talk about the new birth, talk about the death of Christ for our sins, talk about the resurrection from the dead, and then make an invitation. So he did. He kept it simple, intentionally simple so that they could clearly understand the gospel message. He wasn't trying to reach their brains, he was trying to reach their moral hearts. And he did. And apparently there was a much different result. That's exactly what Paul did in Corinth. I mean, the, the city was full of Greek philosophy and orators who loved to espouse their views in Greek philosophy with eloquence, great eloquence. And Paul was neither of those. He, he, he spoke plainly. He determined not to come with excellence of human speaking. He didn't use the secular oratorical style that would have won him points in a debate team, but it wouldn't have gotten anywhere as far as the gospel is concerned. He kept it simple. And the, re and the results were powerful because the message was Jesus and him crucified. The message wasn't Paul and the brilliance of his mind. And Paul could have run circles around any group of people that he talked to intellectually. Uh, many believe that he's one of the premier intellects of all time, just based upon his writings and what we know of his life. But he didn't, he didn't trust in that. He trusted in the gospel itself. And that's what the early church did. They preached Christ and him crucified. And that's what evangelism is. And so we have today lots of evangelism training uh, sessions and and these kinds of things uh, but they were all about spreading the good news of Jesus to testify of him and I think you know in some ways evangelism training can be boiled down to one simple thing 
Tell people about the one who loves you and whom you love. Just tell them that story. Just do it. Just tell them that story. Get, get ready to tell your testimony. And uh, a lot of good can happen. And if somebody asks you a question that you don't know the answer for, get their phone to them and say, can I get back to you on that? You don't have to know the answer right now. That'll eliminate that fear or that apprehension of bringing something up with someone that may actually ask you a tough question that you can't answer. There are lots of questions I can't answer. I think I can answer them, and that's my problem. But if I don't have a good answer, it's better for me just to say, let me get back to you on that. And if they're open and they want truth, then they'll get back to me on that. And I'll get back to them. So some key applications points. Just tell, tell the story of Jesus. Make this about our lives. It's not evangelistic programs. It's an evangelistic church. Remember, this is all highly relational. There's nobody like the church, the body of Christ, that has webs of influence that extend into the community. Tentacles reaching everywhere. In workplaces, neighborhoods, families, sports teams, everything that you can imagine in a, in a society, in a culture. Christians are involved in those things. So let's bloom where we plant and tell people as the Lord opens the door. And I'm convinced of this. Anybody who says, Lord, please open a door for me to tell someone about Jesus today. He loves that prayer and he'll answer it. So when I pray that prayer, and I don't always pray that prayer, but when I do pray that prayer, my next task is to be on high alert because the door is going to open. The door is going to open and I'll have an opportunity. They preach the gospel of Christ, we pointed out that, and the evangelists, by the way, point number three, under key application points, they were involved in equipping. Now this is a really interesting subject, and I wish I could spend a lot of time on this, I can't, but remember, God gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So when I, uh, first time I ever was in Asia, we stopped in Honolulu on the way to Japan, on the way to Indonesia. And uh, I knew Danny Lehman, who was the director of the YWAM base there, and I said, we're gonna be coming through, I'd like to see the base. And he said, well, can you teach in our school of evangelism? Yeah. I mean, that was a little intimidating for me. YWAMers were like up here, and I was like down here somewhere, in my own estimation. So I was a little nervous about that. He said he wanted me to teach on the evangelist as an equipper. Danny's an evangelist. This is going to be really interesting. So I studied it, and I prepared, and I got up in front, and I said nothing that I had prepared, which doesn't happen often to me. It's happened here, <laughs> but it doesn't happen often to me. It happened to that day. Uh, but the evangelist is an equipper. And so I did a podcast with Danny on this subject, the evangelism, the evangelist as an equipper. Because I wanted to get his thoughts and I wanted him to help pastors with this. And one of the things he said is, uh, pastors should, if they don't have a strong evangelism gifting, and in Calvary Chapel, we have Greg Glory, and most of the, a lot of the pioneer Calvary Chapel pastors have a, a strong evangelistic leaning even though they're not primarily evangelists, they're more pastor teachers. But Greg Laurie is an evangelist who's also a pastor teacher. He's a rare hybrid in, uh, in, in the body of Christ. But there are others as well that are just excellent communicators of the gospel. They're within our tribe called Calvary Chapel. But a lot of pastors, they, they identify themselves as, I'm, I'm more of a pastor teacher, I'm really not much of an evangelist. I think I'm sort of in that camp myself. But, uh, if, if that's the case with a pastor, then the pastor should make it a point to identify who the evangelists are that the Lord is bringing into the fellowship or who are coming into the community and utilize those people. Put them up front. Let them do invitations, for example, at the end of a message from time to time. Let them have a service where they can give an evangelistic message. Utilize them. Let them take out teams into the streets and, and do you know, one-on-one -on -one street evangelism. Uh, give them an opportunity in an outdoor venue where they have a, a sound system and they can preach the gospel in the open air and have a team there 
just let them do their thing as evangelists. You know, it's exciting what God is doing with evangelists all over the world. Danny says there are world-class evangelists within YWAM that are in different parts of the world that are on the same level as a Billy Graham and a Greg Laurie in terms of their gifting and their influence in evangelistic ministry. They're just not known here in the States because they're not here. But he's got a team of guys, and I can't remember what they call, but they're called there in Kona. <coughs> But they do a lot of evangelism, and they go out, and, and they're like warrior evangelists, you know, almost. They're just very direct and very effective. But one of the things that they do is they go out on the streets, and, and they go up to people, and they say, is there anything physically that's going on with you that we can pray for? You know, to, a lot of people will talk about their physical ailments, you know. So, yeah, I mean, most people have some kind of physical problem. Uh, and, and, they'll, and they'll say, yeah, I've got this going on or that going on. Would it be okay if we pray for you right now? Would you mind? No, we wouldn't mind. And sometimes, in fact, maybe even oftentimes, the Lord heals the person on the spot. And that whole encounter opens up the door for the gospel, and they preach the gospel to them. And people are getting saved that way just by asking people if they have any physical ailments and can I pray for them. Did you know every one of us can do that? That's easy to do. Because that shows care and concern for a person. That shows love for a person. And then you're always ready for an open door. So let the evangelists get involved with their equipping side of ministry. Because they are there. Billy Graham had the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, right? And that is a huge equipping arm for evangelists and evangelism in churches all over the country, all over the world. It's still going under Franklin Graham's leadership. And, but his crusade evangelism was the thing that was most spotlighted. But in reality, many more people were led to Christ through the influence of these equipping means and through people evangelizing than in other ways. So again, we're part of something really big. Really big. Really, really big. And, uh, it's going to be great. You know, it's really, really big. And so, let's remember that. Okay, water baptism. Part of the Great Commission, Matthew 28. We just read it in Acts chapter 2. They were baptized when they gladly received the Word of God. In Acts 8, in Samaria, they were baptized in water. And... Later on in that chapter, Philip, Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts 8.36, uh, believed the things about the Messiah in Isaiah 53. And he said to Philip, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And remember what Philip asked him, or said to him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And so he went down, notice, into the water and was baptized. So it's baptism by immersion. You can't go into the water unless there's enough water to go into so he went all the way under the baptism by immersion. By the way, we believe in believer's baptism. We don't believe in infant baptism. Infant baptism is like a sacrament in, the, in the, some Protestant churches. And uh, it's really uh, contributed to the death of Christianity in whole countries. Because once a person is baptized in an infant, then they're supposed to discover the meaning of their baptism later in life, but that gives them their membership with the church, with the state church. So their taxes go to the state church, their membership is with the state church, their identification as a Christian is with the state church, but they have no personal relationship with God whatsoever. And so it kills Christianity, and so the state church hires their ministers who are working directly with the state church. And so there is no motivation for the ministers, the pastors, to do anything because they're getting paid by the state because of this whole system of infant baptism that's going on. And so the churches die. And then it's really hard in a state church country because usually the taxation rate is high. They're usually more socialistic in their governmental structure. And so the tax rates can be anywhere from 50 to 70%. Like in Denmark, it's very high, 65% taxation rate, state church. So if you want to plant a church there, 
it's really hard. You're not, because people, they feel like they've already tithed through their taxes to the state. And they, there's very little uh, discretionary income to use to give to the church. So you can't fund those things. So it's just a really tough thing. But they do it anyway. They still charge, start churches and things happen. But the whole system is driven by infant baptism and the whole sacramental system. And, but we don't believe in that. We believe in believer's baptism. So if somebody who is a conscious believer in Jesus Christ, whatever age they are, they know what they're doing, and it can be verified that they know what they're doing, then we'll baptize them as believers. Uh, my son was baptized when he was six. And uh, I felt like he knew what he was doing. Later he lost his mind as a teenager. But <laughs> he, he knew what he was doing, at least for that season in his life. So there's a lot of de these different kinds of examples. So let's wrap up the application points for this. Oh, by the way, Romans 6.3, the last scripture reference I give you. Don't you know as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Uh, there's no water in that verse. Think about it. It's just simply talking about the fact that when we came to Christ, we were placed into him, immersed into Jesus himself, into his death, and into his burial and into his resurrection. I don't think there's any water there, but that may not mean much to you, but think it through. So some key application points I think are important for the church. Maximize rather than minimize the importance of water baptism. Uh, let's make it a bigger deal than it is. Right now it's reserved for occasional times when we have water baptisms, and I think that that, that can help, that can hurt the evangelistic zeal of a church. Because baptisms are very encouraging for people when new people are publicly de declaring their faith in Jesus Christ. That's very encouraging to the church and, and helps heighten evangelistic zeal. So maximize rather than minimize the importance of water baptism. I did a podcast with Ed Compion. Ed Compion uh, is the pastor of Calvary Chapel Shoreline Calvary Chapel in Monterey Bay now, or in uh, Morro Bay. And uh, he was for many years in Kenya as the Calvary Chapel guy who was planting churches in Kenya. And so when I, we started doing the series on the distinctives of Acts chapter 2 in our podcast uh, network, uh, I, I was in a conversation with him. We got to talking about water baptism, and he was telling me about what it was like in Kenya for the believers there to be baptized. And I knew that from my own travels. I knew what he was saying was true because I'd seen some of that myself. And uh, he said, you know, I think there's another distinctive in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2 that you haven't referred to yet. At that point, I had only referred to seven of the distinct or six of the distinctives, uh, Holy Spirit, evangelism, and then the four distinctives of Acts 2.42, which we'll get to. Uh, but I'd only referred to those. I hadn't referred to water baptism. He said, I think that water baptism is a, is a distinctive too. It was really important to the first church. And it was important to them in Kenya, and this is why. Because for them, water baptism symbolized the break, of every, the break from everything that had been in their lives. And in a Muslim country, that's a very big deal. I preach the gospel in Pakistan in open air environments. Literally hundreds of people responded with a show of hands and being willing to pray a prayer. But it didn't mean anything culturally and in their relationships. Muslims were okay with them going to a Christian meeting and they were okay with them even praying a prayer. But once that believer got baptized, what that meant for the Muslim was that that person is disavowing Islam and moving away from Islam and joining Jesus Christ in the church. They have betrayed the Prophet and the Quran and Islam. And so now they're worthy of death. And we were doing a seminar there one time on that trip, that, the only trip I took to Pakistan and while we were doing the seminar, after one session was over, we were notified that an hour away, there was a Christian family who had converted to Jesus through, from Islam, 
and the Islamic leaders in that community found out about it, and they took them down to the river and cut their heads off oh while we were there. And when I was in Indonesia on my very first trip to Asia in 1983, there were literally hundreds of people in the Java Sea, just north of Java, on the northern shore of Java, that were ready to be baptized. They all wore white, and it was very powerful and beautiful, but it was very difficult because the island of Java is 90% Muslim in its population. 200 million people, 90% of them Muslims. People don't know that. There are more Muslims in, in Indonesia than there are in the entire Middle East combined. People don't realize that. And many of them are very radical Muslims. And so some of those, and this was sobering. So here's my first time in the country. I had preached a sermon at 6 a.m. at a church that morning in the first service, and then we went to a country church and I did the second sermon, and then after that was the baptism, and all these people were ready to be baptized, and I was going to be going out in the water baptizing some of these people, realizing that some of them were going to be putting their lives on the line just by being baptized in water. It really meant something to them. It was a crossing over. It wasn't, it wasn't a religious thing. It was a real big deal. It was an identification. And I think that's what the the importance of baptism was in the first church. I mean, you had the mikvahs, which were the ceremonial baths of purification that the Jews were used to. You go down one side of it, and you get completely wet, and then you come out the other side free of your your, uh, former uncleanness. And and that's that's the way that proselytes into Judaism would, would, would process that whole process. But to be baptized by immersion into Christ was a completely different animal altogether. And it meant something to them. So I would say, uh, along the lines of what Ed Compion was encouraging in the podcast, let's maximize rather than minimize the importance of water baptism. And then I wrote the word thoroughly under point number two, thoroughly catechize new converts before they're baptized. I would change that, I would cross out the word, and this is in a conversation with Daryl yesterday. Instead of using the word thoroughly, just as much as you can, teach people what they're doing when they get baptized, before they're baptized. Give them more than they typically have. And, uh, and, and I think that's important. I've done baptisms where I've, I've gone ahead and just baptized people that were bystanders that didn't plan on being baptized, they didn't have a change of clothes or anything, they just went in. And and you never know, you never see them again, you never know if it was real, or were they just caught up in the moment emotionally, what was going on there, maybe there was a friend there that they wanted to impress, or maybe a guy was trying to impress a girl and convince him that he's actually a Christian so that she'll have a relationship with him. He's one of these sly guys that's on the prowl for Christian women. And uh, you know, you never know what you got, so. Put the pause button on that guy and just say, hey, Kim, let's just talk and then just teach him up and uh, let him him know what what they're doing. And then make sure that uh, those being baptized are also baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's a great opportunity to teach people about about the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. You're you're smiling. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, I was just just telling Cindy what our conversation was on that. Mm-hmm. Just that, you know, I mean, I think it's great to be able to give people an understanding of bapti- what water baptism symbolizes, and especially the break with the old life and uh, kind of what, you know, another point we'll talk about maybe, about that thing with the Romanian gypsies. I mean, that was oh, yeah. totally, that that really was pounded home to me. But, I, but the thing is, on the day of Pentecost, when they baptized 3,000, and this was our conversation, uh-huh. they didn't have a whole lot of time to... To, to teach them all about the right. subject, right? Right. But they might have had more of, because uh, they were Jews, and they had a little bit more of a understanding of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It wasn't like they were baptizing Gentiles. They were baptizing people that were right. immersed in the scriptures to some degree. Yeah. Okay. Good. Now I know the reason for the smiling over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would just say, uh, have baptisms more often, and then. Uh, if baptisms are scheduled like quarterly or something like that, if somebody comes to Christ and they got saved real good, 
Why wait? Why wait for a baptismal time? You know, get them baptized earlier, and you know, have friends and family come if they want. And and uh, let's make room for this. This is a big deal. Baptism is a big deal. We don't think we're saved through baptism. Paul the apostle, when he wrote to the Corinthians, he said, you know, uh, I didn't. God didn't, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but he sent me to preach the gospel. If we're saved through baptism, then Paul would have said, Christ sent me to baptize and and preach the gospel, or or sent me to baptize as I preach the gospel, or sent me to baptize so that people could be saved or something like that. But he said, no, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but he sent me to preach the gospel. And in your church, in your case, I baptize some here, some there, but besides that, I don't have any idea if I baptize anybody else. He wasn't keeping track because that wasn't his mission. His mission was to preach the gospel. And so that's an important point to make on this whole baptism issue. Okay, so how are we doing time-wise? Where are we gonna break for lunch at noon? Is that what we're gonna do? Okay, Apostles' Doctrine. This one should be easy because this happens every week here in a myriad ways uh, in the church teaching the, the, the Bible. But the Apostles' Doctrine is what they continued in Acts 2.42. Now we're in the Acts 2.42 distinctives. Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So those are four distinctives. We're going to talk about each one of those a little more briefly. But the Apostles' Doctrine. So these scriptures deal with the ideas of doctrines as, it, as they appear in the New Testament. And so Jesus said concerning the religious leaders in Matthew 15, 9, they were worshiping him in vain and they were teaching the commandments of men as their doctrine, not the commandments of God. In Matthew 16, uh, he was telling the disciples to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they were teaching the doctrine of legalism. And then uh, in Luke's Gospel in 12.1, which isn't listed here, he told them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Does anybody remember what the leaven of the Pharisees is? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Exactly. The leaven of the Pharisees, hypocrisy, play acting. In John 7, uh, they inquired concerning Jesus, how does this man know letters, having never studied, didn't go through any form of rabbinical training? And Jesus said, my doctrine isn't mine, but it's his who sent me. He's referring to the Father. And if anyone wills to do his will, he'll know concerning the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. This is huge. Somebody really wants to know God's will and is hungry and thirsty for God's will, they'll know that the teaching of Jesus is true. There has to be a moral predisposition towards truth for somebody to appreciate it and believe in it. There does. And someone who doesn't have that moral predisposition toward truth won't be able to appreciate it or understand it at all. This is one of the reasons why in this postmodern world in which we live, and maybe we're even in the post-postmodern world at this point, it's taking people a lot longer to come to Christ in many areas of the country. And the reason for that is because they're struggling with the idea of whether it is such a thing as truth at all. And isn't truth relative? And isn't truth subjective? And don't you make up your own truth? And these kinds of these philosophical questions. So when they start coming to a church, for example, and and the Calvary Chapel environment like this is perfect for people like that. If they'll come, and as long as we can dodge the subject areas that are unnecessary and not germane to the person of Christ, like for example, the whole political thing. I remember one time, uh, you know, giving some sort of impression in a message or two that I, that our church was leaning in a, in a certain uh, political direction. And by the way, for the record, I would tell the people, get immersed in a Christian, Judeo-Christian worldview. Understand what the Bible teaches about life in this world on every level, legally, politically, financially, economically, 
religiously everything. What does the Bible teach about the, the ideal society uh, and, and what the worldview should be that we have? Learn that. And then vote those issues. Vote consistently with those issues and get registered to vote. That's what I would do. I wouldn't tell them what candidate to vote for, which party to uh, sign up for. I just didn't feel that was part of my purview at all. I felt like if they had a good, solid Christian worldview and they were registered to vote and they voted consistently with that worldview on a, more of a platform and an issues-based voting record, then they'd do fine. And you know, the, we come as close as we could to electing somebody who, as close as we can imagine, being somewhat of a good leader. <laughs> it's pretty tough. But uh, anyway. Uh, that's what I did. But anyway, I gave the flavor, apparently, that there's, and so this woman came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, I was raised in an evangelical church when I was a little girl, and there were things that happened that just turned me off completely. And so I left, and I've been wandering around doing this and that, and, uh, but somebody told me about this place, and I've come, and I've been here for now for the last month or two. I've really enjoyed it, but I'm really troubled today because this is the impression I'm getting. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't feel like I needed to make a defense or anything for anything, so I didn't want to get into that kind of a discussion with her. But what I did say is, you know, I really thank you for the conversation because I really want us to be all about Jesus and not about extraneous issues primarily. I want, this, I want our church to be about Jesus, so thank you for that. And I need to be sure that on a Sunday morning especially when you're gonna have visitors that are not you know, familiar with who we are and what we do and not used to the vibe, I wanna be sure that I'm sensitive to those people I know a church that's in Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas. It happens to be a very new agey, post postmodern kind of a community. And this pastor is perfect for that community. I mean, he just loves the people that live there. He loves the transgender people and the gay people. He loves everybody. He just loves every aspect. And, he, and he's the kind of guy that is perfect to try to reach them. And so these people are coming to the church and they're sitting under the teaching of the word week after week. And some of them are getting saved and it's outstanding and they're, they're drinking coffee at their coffee shop throughout the week and just hanging out and sort of getting informally discipled and all this. But then there were these older curmudgeons that came into the church. <laughs> and they just, you know, they just had... They had strong political leanings, which is okay to have strong political positions and leanings, totally okay. But they wanted to make that the focus of their fellowship. And so they'd be out there in the foyer, you know, where people would have to pass through to go into the sanctuary. And these conversations were out loud. And so these people coming in from the community thinking they're coming into this thing that they went to last week are now coming in they're wondering what planet am I walking on to right now? Because it's completely different than the world that they're used to. So it so alienates them, they feel like they can't trust a single thing that's going on. It was an unnecessary thing. So when the pastor went to these curmudgeons and said, guys, can you just tone it down? Have your conversation at a coffee shop in a back room somewhere or, or some, you know, just, Fine on your own, but let's not make that what this is about. You've got to tone it down. Well, they got so mad at him, they left the church and they pulled all of the people away. And so now what was a thriving, wonderful, Jesus-preaching, evangelistic, equipping church is down to about eight people. Eight people. Because of the curmudgeons. They just couldn't put the gospel first. Isn't that sad? Yes. They hurt the kingdom. Now they thought that they were absolutely right in everything they were doing. And they may have been right politically. They may have been right in their view of the world. They were not wrong. They were not right 
and the way they chose to express it on Sunday morning when they needed to be sensitive to the people they were coming. But the truth is, they didn't care about those people very much. If they did, if they cared about them, they'd have been sensitive toward them. Does that make sense? Yes. So, the Apostle's Doctrine. How did I get onto that subject from the Apostle's Doctrine? <laughs> Holy Spirit! <laughs> Thank you. So, a lot of passage talking about doctrine. In, verse, uh, in Romans 16, that reference, Note those, brethren, who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. So the doctrine that is essential and is central to any church is the first commandment, which is love for God with all our hearts, and the second commandment, which is to love our neighbor as ourselves. This is the doctrine of Christ. And then in the church, to love our brother and love our sister, to love one another. We have to love one another. We have to respect one another. And it's a great concern for pastors all over the country now. What's, gonna, what's the post-COVID-19 church going to look like? People that are really upset, they didn't wear masks. People that are really upset, they wore masks. <laughs> I mean, you know, people are really tweaked about this stuff. And they're developing into camps about this. And they're already determining their attitude towards other believers. Is the basis of our fellowship our stance about COVID? Or is the basis of our fellowship Jesus Christ Amen. and Him crucified. Amen. Isn't He the center and the focus of the unity of the faith? It should be. It absolutely should be. But essential to all of this, and when COVID first hit, I thought, oh, I can see this coming. This is becoming a Romans 14 issue. In Romans 14, it was the eating meat issue and observing certain days as opposed to other days issue. And those that were strong in the faith from Romans 14 were the ones that could eat any kind of meat, didn't matter where it came from, and they could observe any day. One day was not any more special than another. They were the strong ones. The weak ones were the ones that said, no, it has to be this day, and it has to be that kind of meat, and it can't be that kind of meat. And Paul didn't take sides. He said, here's the deal, gang. The important thing is that we love one another. So you that are strong, you are not allowed to despise those that you consider weak. And you that are weak, you are not allowed to judge those that are considered strong. So there's a despising and a judging thing going on. We can't do it. And in relationship to COVID, who are the strong and who are the weak? I have no idea. <laughs> Is the strong person the one that wears a mask? Maybe. Is the strong person the one who doesn't wear a mask? Maybe. I don't think there's a clear delineation at all. The thing that is essential is we have to respect one another's right to decide on their own. Isn't that true? We have to respect one another. You're my brother, and you are responsible to Jesus and for your own life. So mask or no mask, that is not the question, like we were talking about yesterday. It's not a question of Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> to mask or not mask, that is the question. It's not it. You know, I was talking to a pastor in a podcast interview about this the other day. He said, you know, I'm, I'm in the vulnerable age bracket. Said, I don't want to get COVID. So I wear a mask and I want people around me to wear one too. And he came to a pastor's conference that I saw him at, wearing a mask. And he noticed everybody wasn't wearing a mask around him. He didn't get upset with anybody. He just wanted to be safe. And so his conviction was that the mask would help him do that. Is he right? I don't know. Maybe the mask doesn't help at all. I don't know. Some people think it does. Some people think it doesn't. But you have every right to wear one and do what you think is the right thing for you. I have no opinion. I'm not your judge. I'm not the one who has to determine your life. I'm so glad that the Lord has freed me from that part of my job description. I am not a judge. I just don't have to be one. And I love the freedom of it. When I was more convinced that I should be a judge, that was a heavy burden to bear. I don't like to have to decide about people and things that aren't essential. I just don't like to. I don't like it. <laughs> At all. 
I used to like it because I was more combative than I am now, but <laughs> somewhere along the line I took a chill pill. <laughs> I love getting older. I do. I think it's awesome. <laughs> it's freedom, yeah. Care what anybody thinks about me. <laughs> so, the doctrine, the apostles' doctrine, and so there are a lot of scriptures here, but the key, most important scripture is probably 2 Timothy 3 15 through 17, where Paul says, From childhood, Timothy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then Paul told Timothy in his last letter, next chapter, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. According to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and will, they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to faith. <clears throat> so when Paul wrote to Timothy, uh, they didn't have all of the New Testament books collected into one volume like we have them today, but most of the books were in circulation. All the Gospels are in circulation except for the Gospel of Mark and the Book of Revelation was not in circulation, had been written yet. But the Gospels are in circulation, all the epistles were in circulation to some degree, so the churches were becoming increasingly familiar with all of the different letters that John and James and Paul had written and Peter had written. So there wasn't a problem not being aware, but they all had the Old Testament scriptures, all of them, all of the 39 books of the Old Testament available to them. And so the Apostles' Doctrine consisted of all of the Bible that they had. And they just opened it up and helped the people understand it. They did what was done in the days of Nehemiah when Ezra the priest, Ezra the scribe, got up and stood before the people and read out loud from the Old Testament scriptures. And then he had people throughout the crowd that were also able to understand what these scriptures meant. And they were explaining to the large crowd giving them a sense of what, what the scriptures meant as Edward, Ezra was reading and explaining himself. And the people were overwhelmed by the word of God. That's what we need to do in our churches, teaching the whole counsel of God. And that's what happens with, with Calvary chapels. That's our aim. Uh, that's what we want to do. And we want, the, we want Jesus to reveal and illuminate the Bible to us, and we want the Bible to illuminate Jesus for us. We believe that Jesus works with the scriptures, and we believe the scriptures uh, put Jesus on display. So that's what we do. Um, so here's the key application points down at the bottom. Learn the Bible. Read all of it. If you don't read the whole Bible, may I encourage you to start reading the whole Bible. I was telling uh, Pastor Darrell that I have never, I've taught through every book of the Bible except the Song of Solomon. I've never taught through that book. I'm getting close to being willing to do that. <laughs> and, and I'm going to do it. I'll probably do it on YouTube first, you know. And, uh, but, but I had to wait until I was comfortable with what, what I felt it was saying and what its intention was. And then I realized, you know, I need to read it as poetry because that's what it is. It's Hebrew poetry. And poetry hits people in different ways. All kinds of poetry does. And so, how is this reaching my life? And as I began to read it year after year, I noticed that it was actually speaking to me. And I wasn't quite sure how to put my finger on it. You know, how is it speaking to me? But it's getting more clear every year. And so I'm getting closer to teaching it. But reading the whole Bible is important. I remember a guy coming up to us. I used to challenge the church every year. Read the whole Bible this year. You can do it in a year about five chapters a day, it's not that hard, it doesn't take that much time, just read through the whole Bible. And there was a guy who was very prominent, he had worked very closely with Francis Schaeffer in his ministry, and then Frankie Schaeffer later. He was a high-profile leader 
He was actually the first millionaire I ever met, which doesn't mean anything. But anyway, <laughs> he was prominent in evangelicalism, let's put it that way, and very active in ministry. And he was a strong advocate for pro-life. He helped us form the board for our Crisis Pregnancy Center on the Monterey Peninsula. He was a wonderful guy. But he, after I made the challenge that year, he said, you know, I've never read through the whole Bible. He said, I'm going to try it. I'm going to take you up on your challenge this year. So I didn't think anything of it. You know, the year went by, and then the next year he came up to me and he said, I cannot begin to tell you, Bill, what this has meant to me, reading through the whole Bible. Thank you for issuing that challenge. And I think it's important to just read through the whole Bible. And you know, personally, just to tell you what I do, I read it out loud. I do that because, first of all, it helps me from wandering in my mind. It also helps me avoid falling asleep. <laughs> Just being honest. And then, uh, but also, it, I'm verbalizing the Bible. And so it's coming out of my mouth, so I have to think about it in a certain way before I can actually enunciate the words and then it's coming out of my mouth and going back into my ears so I'm hearing it again as I'm reading it and it gives me an opportunity to just pause anytime I want and since I'm reading and I'm in an out loud mode anyway it's real easy for me just to stop and just talk to the Lord about a passage Lord this I just feel like you're speaking to me right now from this verse what do you want are you what are you trying to say to me or how do you want me to apply this? Or this is what I see from this passage, and I'm guilty of this, Lord. I confess it to you. It's wonderful. There's a, an increased fellowship. And much of my prayer life stems from just my Bible reading, frankly. Reading it out loud. So I encourage that. Try it out. It's not the only way, but if it works for you, then uh, you can give that a try. But read through the whole Bible. There are Bible reading schedules galore. There are Bible reading apps galore. You can find a good one. I use the one by Discipleship Ministries, uh, which uh, has me in the go a gospel every single day of the year. So I read through the, every gospel twice during the year. And it has me in an epistle every day. And it has me, uh, depending on the time of year, in a poetry passage, typically every day, and also in an in a Old Testament narrative passage. So. I read through the whole Bible that way, and, and I'm staying fresh. And I have to be in a gospel every day. No matter what I'm reading, I have to be in a gospel every day because I never want to lose sight of Jesus. I just, I want him to be front and center in my thinking all the time, you know. And so learning him and connecting with him, and it's not just the gospels that do that, by the way. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling of Jesus. It's the clearest presentation of Jesus today that we have. So I read the book of Revelation too, of course, every year. So learn the Bible, read all of it, and be diligent in studying it. Use the IBS method. That's inductive Bible study method. If you don't know that method, haven't used it, I encourage you to go to icmbible.com, icmbible.com. You can take the seven assignment seminar and induct a Bible study. You can send your assignments in. ICM will evaluate your assignments, make comments on your work, send it back to you, and it's all for about like 45 bucks for the whole thing. It's a deal. Have you guys had Dan out here? Yeah. Dan Finfrock? No, well, we did the video, his video. Did you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that's yeah. great. So people are familiar with Dan yeah. Finbrock and IBS, okay. Well, he's happy to come if you ever wanted to have him in person, you know. The, he's a, like a rock star. Yeah. You know, he'll come. Uh, Dan is the most humble man I know. I've been on his board since 1986. And uh, he's one of the, he should be in Hebrews 11. <laughs> in some ways, you know, he's that kind of guy. You know, I love him a lot, and uh, he, he teaches in Dr. Wild study. And if he can't make it, I teach it too, so I'd be happy to do it. Uh, teach the Bible. Of course, that's being done. Uh, teach the Bible in children's ministry, in junior high and senior high, in college and career ministries, in women's studies and men's studies. Teach the Bible. Make that the curriculum. Utilize the teachings of the Bible to shape the church. 
Uh, what does the Bible say we should do? That's the question. And, uh, you know, what church do we want to be like, by the way? The tendency is to look around horizontally at other churches and see what they're doing, and then borrow from what seems to be working in other churches. I'm not a fan of that approach. I think we need to look back to the best church in church history, which is the apostolic church. I used to say the early church, but that takes you up into the first, end of the first century, into the second church century, and, and the church got pretty messed up in places already by then. So the apostolic church was most, most pure and most holy. So what did they do? And remember, Jesus prayed for, uh, he prayed the high priestly prayer in John 17. He prayed for those that would believe in, that, that he had worked with. He prayed for his disciples, okay, the 12. And then he prayed for those that would believe on him through the apostles' testimony. That would be all of us. We're Christians today because of the apostles. Were it not for the apostles, we wouldn't be believers today. So this is how he prayed. I pray not only for these that have followed me, but I also pray for these who have believed in me through their word, that they may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and as I am in you, that they may be one in us. What was Jesus praying for? He was praying for every subsequent church through every age of the church to be one with the apostles. He wasn't calling for horizontal unity for all the churches that exist in a given age. He was calling for a backwards unity to the apostles and to the apostolic church. And the thing is, is that if a, any church in a community has backwards unity with the apostles, we're going to have horizontal unity with each other. And that's how it works. So we need to do that. So how did the... Reading the book of Acts, we have the book of Acts, it's inspired scripture, so that we can see what their life was like living by the Holy Spirit. And it was an e-ticket ride, for those of you that remember what those are. <laughs> it was for Disneyland, you know, these days. <laughs> e-tickets were the best tickets, because you could get on the Matterhorn, yeah. the monorail, <laughs> the submarine with an e-ticket. And then they changed the whole system and said, you got to pay a million dollars to buy one ticket. <laughs> 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 anyway. They had a wild ride in the book of Acts. And the Spirit of God led them into some amazing adventures. So, and then disciple the people with the Bible. Don't reach for the Christian book shelf and you know pull the first book on discipleship you have off that and use that not that those things aren't good there are some really good discipling tools but the bible is our discipleship book i remember the guy that wanted to disciple me initially he said maybe we should read the bible together i said that sounds like a good idea he said what should we read he said how about if we read he said how about if we read galatians great, what's a Galatian? <laughs> no idea what a Galatian was. But we read the book of Galatians. And then, not long after that, I ended up being in a Christian commune here in Boise. And we would do contract work, and I ended up having connections with Mormons that we're working for. And I had read the book of Galatians, and I knew Galatians 1.8. But if we or any angel from heaven should preach any other gospel unto you other than that which you have heard, let him be accursed. I knew that much, enough to scare the Mormon. <laughs> I wouldn't use that technique today, by the way. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a, it's a relational evangelism with most Mormons, right? I mean, it really is. And they're hungry, by the way. I have a, a, a friend who lives in Spanish Fort, Utah. I was telling Cindy about that last night, and he came up from Huntington Beach. Completely two different cultures, Huntington Beach, Spanish Fort, Utah. And uh, he's just doing it right. He's just a friendly guy, and his wife is hospitable, so he just has them all come over to his house. They do barbecue. They just connect. And the, 
he asks them how they're doing and what they do for a living and all that, and then they ask him, what do you do? And he goes, oh, I'm a bank manager, and which he was. And, and he says, yeah, and, and then he'll mention, I teach a Bible study in my house once a week. You're welcome to come if you want. Some of them come, and they get saved. And he starts discipling, and they leave the Mormon church. And it's all relational, organic. I got another guy I met doing a wedding in Southern California. He's pastor of a Calvary Chapel east of Salt Lake City, east of the epicenter. And uh, his church has grown like crazy. And almost all of the converts came from the Mormon church. They're coming to Christ. So I said, you tell me now, of all of these conversions, what's the common thread? What's the one thing that's common to all of them? And he didn't hesitate. He said, they start reading the Bible on their own. They start reading the Bible on their own. And when they do, they compare what the Bible actually teaches with what they've been learning growing up. And they ditch that and go for that. Isn't that awesome? The Lord is doing the work. He's doing it everywhere. Okay, so, disciple the people of the Bible. The Bible rocks, like my friend said. The Bible rocks. Okay, so how are we doing? We got... Okay, uh, yeah, I'm going to do the last couple. Are we, are we going to have a session after lunch that I could teach a little bit more? Okay. I'm having fun teaching you guys, you know, sharing the word with you. This is really fun. Are you guys enjoying yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. Really do. Appreciate you guys as a group. It's wonderful. So I know you've been sitting a long time. We get to eat a nice lunch. Yeah, we'll pray for the meal. And uh, thank the Lord for his provision. Isn't it awesome? He gives us something to eat. <laughs> How many prayed, give us this day our daily bread this morning? <laughs> Those of you that did, thank you for praying that. I got a whole refrigerator work, you know, at home, you know, weeks worth of bread. But I still pray for it every day. So thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, and thank you, Jesus, for being the living bread which came down from heaven. And thank you for the daily bread that you ask us to pray for. You provide for us, Lord, and it's amazing. And even in these days of COVID, where family economies have been really hindered and hurt through loss of jobs and lack of income, still you've promised that those who seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, all the things that we need will be added unto you, unto us. So thank you for your provision, Lord. We don't take it for granted. So give us this day our daily bread as you've told us to pray. Thank you for this meal that you've provided. May you nourish our bodies with it and bless our palates with it. And then also, Lord, as we just connect with each other, bless our fellowship with one another. This is a holy moment to be able to connect with other peoples in whom the Spirit of God dwells. So we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.